Good morning, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. Good to see folks uh, trickling in here. You know, is it like as a streamer, uh, one of the things that they tell you is you only gain followers while you're streaming live. And I, I always notice that and I see that, you know, like if you look at my, my subscribers, it's nothing, 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 nothing. And then live streaming, it goes nothing, nothing, nothing. You know, it's, it's funny how that works. Um, uh, Sequel Dev DBA says, any thoughts on PPF for the Speedster? PPF is like paint protective film. Um, do you have it on any of your other cars? So for the Speedster, it's a, an ivory color that is uh, not metallic. It's flat or, you know, it's glossy, but it's not metallic. Um, so it hides dirt really well. It's also not a valuable car, not like a valuable paint job. Ballpark, you can buy Speedsters for around 50000 bucks, which, yes, I get it. It's a lot of money. But in the collector car world, it's not a lot of money. Um, so it's it'd be relatively easy to repaint inexpensively. It's not like something like a Ferrari where the factory paint job is worth a whole ton of money. So it, because good PPF is usually a couple thousand bucks, even just for the front end, let alone the whole car. I don't bother with the Speedster. The Speedster replica is something that I like to be able to beat the bejesus out of, you know, take it on long road trips and not feel guilty about it. Um, the I have a, I do have full paint protective film on both of the Jaguars, the two 2013 Jaguar XKRSs. I don't have it yet on the Ferrari. The Ferrari is still in restoration out in the Mojave desert when it comes back and is done from that i'll have the paint color corrected and then full ppf put on that because that that one's an investment oh no bredis oh no god that's so sad to hear bredis says i was laid off from aws yesterday i'm here to cry my beer and learn some valuable career uh, advice but i could join the life you know, it's such a weird time in the economy. A lot of people are getting laid off through no fault of their own. I always read a lot of this stuff on Hacker News where uh, p companies like to hire aggressively when money is freely available. And then like now when interest rates skyrocket and it's hard to rise funding, but a lot of companies lay off to reduce expenses and just give themselves more runway. The, the best thing that I would say is it's most likely nothing to do with you whatsoever. I have friends who uh, were very good at their gigs at Microsoft, at Amazon, Facebook, and got laid off just because of you know sheer market forces. So uh, don't take it uh, too personally there. If you have the financial ability, the best thing that I would say is take two weeks to yourself. You know, just read books, uh, play video games to decompress and then step back. You'll make better decisions as to which jobs you take next. Because if you try to run straight into something out of sheer desperation, you're probably going to take something that isn't great for you long term. I would also say don't don't use it as a like one of those things where you go, oh, God. God, I got to think back about what it is I really want to be when I grow up. If you were having a good time before, don't let the some temporary economic thing uh, try to change the way that your career was going. If you were having a good time, by all means, uh, stick with it. Um, the other thing that I would say is don't people are often tempted to go, oh, now's the time when I should start consulting. I should hang out my own shingle or hang out my own sign and start uh, accepting clients. It is so hard to, to build the list of clients uh, and to get enough work coming in through the door. There's usually a real long lead time before people pay you. Um, so unless you have, like, say, three to six months in savings that you're comfortable burning through, because when you start consulting with no prep work ahead of time, you will burn through three or six months worth of savings. Don't be tempted to go, oh, now, now's the time where I should hang out my hat. It's it's a great time to be a consultant for sure because so many people are or so many companies are laying people off that they're very interested in outside consultants. But it just does take a while to build up that reputation and get the clients coming in the front door. All right, so let's half baked full stack. Oh, what an awesome name that is! That's fantastic. I love it. So uh, let's go take a look at your questions. Oh, Bretta says, I was a consultant with AWS. I learned I did not like consulting. I'd rather have a list of items to work on in a sprint and then uh, be left the heck alone. 
I totally feel you. Consul- I have friends who've tried to do the consulting thing, and it, it's what's the great joke? Why work 40 hours a week for somebody else when you can work 80 hours a week for yourself? Uh, and and re- often in a consulting environment, that's true. You're constantly watching your hours. You're having to be billable all the time and, and still manage your own personal growth. So it's it's good that you had that learning experience and now want to do something else. Um, Janice says, this is an accidental team lead. I can identify with this. I'd also just like to do a sprint list and uh, be left alone. So many of us who are tech contributors, like indiv- individual contributors, uh, get suckered into this thing where believe, we believe that we have to lead a team in order to move up in our careers. And it's true in that often if you're an individual contributor and you take on management responsibilities, you'll get an incremental raise, like a 5%, 10%, 20% raise. But within a matter of months or a year, you're doing truly different work than what you were doing before, and it may not be enjoyable to you. Managing people who are individual contributors is just nowhere near the same as doing the work that those individual contributors did. I'm same way here. This is why I stopped uh, trying to grow a consulting company. I realized that I did not have the stomach to manage groups of people uh, or worry about their them making their mortgage payments. It just wasn't a good time for me. Like, because in tech, sooner or later, you have to lay people off. You know, you go through these little cycles, um, and it just gutted me to think that I would have to lay somebody off because of an economic cycle or because we couldn't get enough work in. That just totally was not for me. Not my bag. Uh, Genesty says, facts, I do it because our team is very green, meaning new, uh, new employees, or, or junior, junior's a better way of saying it, and I love teaching what I know, it just consumes a lot of time. Yeah, and the, the better that you get on it, the better that you get at it, the more individual reports you get, and then you start going up higher <coughs> in management, and you start having to manage managers, and oh, it's, it's weird. Hmm. I love training people, too. I mean, like, I always loved mentoring other people. But I figured out that I could do it as a teacher, in, you know, as a tech teacher, uh, instead of doing it inside a company. And I was like, oh, this actually works better for me because I can sharpen my knives at building training material. There's a good question related to that. I'm going to go pick it out of the queue. Uh, Mache asked, did it actually pop in there? No, it did not. Let me go hit that button again so it pops out. Do, 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 do. Mache asks, how do you know when you're working, when you're working on the course of training, how do you know that the current version of the course of training is good enough? I'm asking because my friend has a tendency to spend an enormous amount of time when he's working to prepare a presentation. The, the first thing you do is go write the takeaway slide. When you're building a presentation, write the takeaway slide, the last slide that's going to be in the presentation, where you go, in summary, here's what you learned. Those bullet points, you know, you give yourself three, four, five bullet points. That's all you need to do in the presentation, and that's it. And so for every one of those bullet points, you probably want me personally, from a timing perspective, for every slide, I spend about 60 seconds. Overall, on average, when I'm doing training, it's about a slide every 60 seconds. There are decks where I have, you know, like punchline slides, very funny slides that I only spend 13 seconds on. I have other slides where I talk for three or four minutes. Uh, so, but overall, on average, it's about a slide per minute. So when I have these, if I'm doing a one-hour session and I have five bullet points at the end, I go, well, at most, I get 10 slides on each one of these bullet points, and that's all I get because that's 50 minutes. And you need to have a little bit of time for a Q&A at the end. You need to worry about if you're running late, you know, what material would you cut. But you can figure that for one takeaway slide with five bullet points on it, you take the amount of time that you're going to train and then divide that out. That's how many slides you get. That really helps you rein it in because you're like, oh, I just want to teach one. I need, I need to tell them one more thing. And there's an important thing they got to know. That's okay because you're going to have that takeaway slide. And then immediately after that, you're going to say, 
your next steps on your learning journey or other resources that I found useful. And then you're going to link to a handful of other things that people who actually sat through your entire presentation and want to know more places where they can go. So that's how I approach uh, solving that problem. The other way that, I, that helps me a lot is at the beginning when I'm writing a module, I will write these are the things that are in scope. These are the things that the people attending it already know, so I don't have to teach them. These are the things that are out of scope. They're probably important, but I don't have the time to teach them this today. And so it helps me kind of zone in and, and put a, a, st a stopper on it there. Uh, next up, Alex asks, I need to upgrade SQL Server VMs. Right now they're running on SQL Server 2016. I want to upgrade to SQL Server 2022. My manager doesn't want to make too many changes at once because an upgrade is complex. But if I think that we don't move, if we don't move to 2022 now, we will never do. Is it worth the fight? Why? Why? What are you going to get out of 2022? What are you putting your reputation on the line for with your manager? What are the specific, measurable things that you're going to get that the business is going to go, ooh, that's worth paying you money to work longer on the thing? Put it down into writing, figure out exactly what the benefits are, and then that's how you, t you uh, convert your manager to it. If the benefits are fuzzy, we'll be on the latest thing. It seems cooler. It has more features. Then ask yourself if you were the manager and you were going to write a check for your salary for the two months that it takes in order to do all these upgrades. I'm just pulling numbers out of a hat. Say that it's $20,000 US. Would you pay with your money $20,000 to have that stuff? Or would you give yourself a raise? Maybe we don't spend money on things in technology that don't have a payoff, and maybe we ask for a raise instead. The more you can be cognizant of that money all comes out of the same pot, and then it starts to help. Gringo Malbec asks, Hi, Brent. In my opinion, SQL Server really shines when it comes to column store indexes. I would pretty much agree. I'm familiar with your fundamental series as well as Nico's blog site. Is there any chance that you would write more blog posts about it? Sure. What do you need? At the end of the fundamentals class, I actually talk about that. At the end of the fundamentals class, I say, all right, if I was going to write a mastering class on it, here are the topics that I would cover. Am I going to do that? Yeah, probably at some point in the future, but then when I do it, I'm probably going to do it as a mastering class, like a mastering column store indexes. And the demand for that is relatively low. The people who need it really, really need it, but there just aren't that many of them. So to give you some insight on how building training works, it, it usually takes me like two or three weeks of work in order to build a mastering class. Then it'll take me another week to record it, to like do all the demos, record everything in front of cameras. So you're talking about ballpark a month's worth of work. I need to make back that much money. And so to do that, it makes sense if the class has as much widespread appeal as possible so that more students are likely to buy it. Whereas something like Mastering Column Store, there just aren't many people like you and I that really need mastering level details on it. Uh, good to see you as well. Big Hugger says, do you consider the SQL Server 2016 is already out of mainstream support? I don't. It's not a factor for most businesses. Most businesses don't care because they still get security updates on it. So. Next up, Champagne DBA asks, the dev team has created new pages in an app where every column of a display can be filtered or sorted. There are only 10 columns, but holy cow, that's a lot of combinations. Any tips on indexing this nightmare? Yeah, here's all you do. Put it into production with a clustered index and that's it. You're like, oh my god! Remember, this is brand new pages in an application. Nobody's used this before. You don't know what they're going to sort on. Maybe they're going to sort a lot on price. Maybe they're going to sort a lot on category. You just don't have a way of knowing when an application is brand new because end users are crazy. They're wildly unpredictable. So go live. 
Then watch the index recommendation DMVs, watch the plan cache, and see which combinations of sorts get used the most often. That will help you design your indexing strategy. I got a, a slide that I use with clients, and I say, really, at the end of the day, if you need things to go faster, you have three dials that you can turn in SQL Server. You have the table design dial, you have the uh, query design dial, and you have hardware. If we're saying that people can sort by anything that they, they want any time, well, that just takes the query design dial out of the uh, picture. I can't turn that up any higher. I can't fine tune that. You've chosen to go all the way down as low as it can possibly go. Table design dial, you could build indexes. You could build reporting copies of the table. Now, it's going to slow down inserts, updates, and deletes, but if you don't do that many inserts, updates, and deletes, that's a valid answer. For example, Stack Overflow on the way up had like 40, 50, 60 indexes on the most commonly queried tables because there weren't really that many new questions coming in per second, for example. And then finally, there's the hardware dial. And I talk when I'm talking with my dot-com clients, people who have venture capital funding, I say that as a starting point, take the size of the database and double it. That's how much memory you want. So if you have a 200 gig database, you should aim for 400 gigabytes of RAM for SQL Server. Now, for those of you who haven't been .com funded or VC funding before, you're like, oh my god, that's insane amount of you know, memory. You can buy a workstation from Dell, a workstation on your desk with 768 gigs of RAM for less than $30,000. $30,000 might also sound like a lot to you, but remember, we're talking about companies with VC funding that's often in the tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, and they need to be fast as quickly as possible. They need their website to be fast. So memory covers all kinds of sins. You just throw that memory in, and it buys you some runway. It's much easier to do sorting when that data is cached up in RAM. Uh, feel like for, for a couple of y'all have asked questions, make sure to read the URL there on the screen about where to put your questions in, because that's the queue that I work through there. Guaro SQL says, I have a database with a terabyte and a half of data. Of data. 1.2 terabytes is just one table. Is that possible to f store that table in another file group and try to restart that table? I can't delete data. Well, if you can't delete data, does it matter where it's stored? As long as people are still actively querying it, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Now, if the problem that you're trying to solve is slow backups, yes. You can put the older data in another database even, and you can use a synonym to point to it. You can use a view that unions all between the old and new tables. But if you're trying to put, uh, if you're trying to make read queries go faster and people can still hit those old rows, then it's not really going to help you all that much. All right, we're going to take stop and take a 90-second ad break. For those of you who are subscribed to my Twitch channel, you won't see any ads. But for those of you who are not subscribed, you're going to get 90 seconds worth of ads while we go on and take a look at the next question. So let's see here. Next question. Ron Howe asks, is there any way to live debug a SQL Server that's 100% CPU throttled uh, so bad that you can't get a connection to it? Yes, it's called the DAC, the Distributed Admin, or <laughs> Distributed Dedicated Admin Connection. If you go to brentozar.com slash go slash DAC, we have a whole blog post explaining how you go about doing it. I just had to do that. A week ago, week and a half ago, I had that exact problem where customer SQL Server is at 100% CPU. So SQL Server starts up this dedicated admin connection that has its own amount of CPU, one CPU scheduler, and a small amount of RAM so that you can run single-threaded uh, troubleshooting queries, and they work just fine. Um, the dedicated admin connection. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, next up. Also, I want a Ferrari uh, says, hello, I'm from Eastern Europe and I work as a SQL developer. I'm looking for ways to get a job in the U.S. and the U.K. where a junior salary is double uh, the uh, over where I'm at. I would be happy to get advice on where to look. 
The problem with that is that American companies then have to figure out all the tax and legal implications of hiring you if they want to bring you over to the United States and work in their offices, it's a giant pain in the rear for a visas and getting uh, political approval. The visa has to be tied to a specific candidate, which means that they're waiting on the government to get that visa approved for you. It'll take forever to get you started. Companies will almost never do that for things like a mid-level mid -level or junior developer. The only people that they do that for are real rock stars, like people to absolute top of their game or herds of people who will effectively work for nothing like that they're going to bring you over and they're going to pay you pennies because they know they have you locked in so that's not, that's not a great option what can work though is if you have a consulting company and you deeply specialize in something that's expensive to fix i'll give you a great example I am an international consultant in the sense that I have clients all over the world and where the exchange rates make sense, they'll hire me. For example, I have clients in uh, Europe who will hire me to work remotely for them. Then they don't have to worry about visas or anything like that. They're just buying a service from me and then they're out. It only works if you uh, contract in places or consult in places that are more expensive than your current cost of living. For example, I have no clients in India or South Africa because the exchange rates don't work out worth a damn. It would be high, easier to hire a person for a year than it would be to hire somebody uh, like me for a week. So kind of tricky. Uh, X Bob the Lobster says, Bob, good to see you again. Uh, says more most UK companies are the same. They want you in the UK, and I that's true for me as well. Like a, what a lot of UK companies will uh, contact me and say, Hey, do you know anyone who's identical to you but in the UK? And I'm like, Well, are you going to have them come into your offices? No, but we just want a UK uh, client, so it works better in time zones. I'm like, Okay, well that's that's your call, but unfortunately, it's that's not me. Uh, next up, Mark says, I recently started at a new place, and I've been, look, six months ago that you can't claim new guy status for six months. That ain't recent. That's longer than the term that some po politicians have had, more than their entire term. Who was that prime minister over in the UK who was like in and then she left within like a month or something? It was catastrophic. So they've been working through digging their databases, and they have like 10 views that pull from open row set. It seems like static data, but I'm worried about security. The easy thing is find out if it actually is static data and just pull it into SQL Server. Pull it into SQL Server so that it's a table, and then you don't have to worry about that open row set thing. Plus, you'll get much better uh, performance on the queries as well. Thanks, Eagle Coder. Uh, Peter asks, you mentioned Quest Toad for SQL Server. Besides Service Broker configuration, what do you think it does better than Management Studio? So it's been 10 plus well, 15 years since I've used it. So I couldn't tell you what's better uh, today. Your best bet would be to go download an eval copy, evaluation copy. They give them away for like 15 days for free. Uh, so then that way you can see everything that it does because I'm sure it's changed so much in the last decade plus. Next up, oh, this is kind of related to that last one. Miguel asks, is manager bias against remote DBAs a legit concern? If so, how should you deal with it? I wouldn't say it's just DBAs. I, part of the thing with being a database administrator is you're a central part during emergency troubleshooting. The DBA has to interface with the sysadmins, the business users, the developers, the stakeholders, all these different people. We're kind of like a central hub with a whole bunch of spokes going out. So when emergency troubleshooting happens or brainstorming or anything like that, and everyone else is in a room and the DBA is not, the manager will absolutely be biased against that because troubleshooting will be slower or brainstorming, whatever. If everyone is remote, 
or even like just a majority of the people are remote, then it's not going to be a big problem. So the, the same thing has happened with me with several companies during COVID. Uh, these companies that used to say, you have to be on site when we work together. You absolutely have to be in this room in your know, middle of nowhere, South Dakota. Um, then all of a sudden when uh, COVID hit and everyone was working from home, all of a sudden management changed their tune. And they're like, well, sure, you can work remote. All our people are remote, so it doesn't, it's not really any worse. But over time, as people have started to come back to the office, if even one third or one half of the people are in the office, then usually management wants the central uh, hub in the office as well, just for faster, easier troubleshooting when all hell breaks loose. And after all, that's what they really pay you for is when all hell breaks loose. Uh, next up, Anatoly asks, what are the pros and cons of running SQL Server business logic in an agent job via scheduled task? They both suck. They both suck. They both suck. Troubleshooting is terrible. Security is terrible. All of that. These things are meant as kind of like crutches. They're not something that you want to build your business on. When you have business logic, you want to put it in something, get your pencil ready, called an application. And applications run, keep that pencil, there's something else important here. Applications run on something called an application server. SQL runs on a SQL server. When you have T-SQL that you need to run, your T-SQL executes on a SQL server. Applications run on an application server. It's kind of catchy, isn't it? Kind of makes sense once you think about it that way. Go build yourself an application. There we go. <laughs> Genestia says, uh, I just I wish hell broke loose more often. Uh, uh, Sky Skyward Dev says, my company just mandated RTO. As a database administrator, RTO immediately means recovery time objective to me. And it took me a beat in order to figure out that you meant return to office. 100% uh, the case you described. Yeah, that's, for, that's been the case with me for a lot of my clients. Um, everybody went 100% remote for a long time. And then now it's gradually tickling, ticking, ticking back up tickling back up. They're tickling each other in person in the office. Um, so I, I th more of my clients are starting to say you have to be here in the office. Um, also, the, the, during the pandemic, I changed my rates. Uh, I said, OK, I, travel sucks for business. I, I can't stand business travel because it's always someplace that I don't want to go at a time that I don't want to be there. Um, so I said, OK, fine. Here's my rate for remote, my rate for in person is three times that. It's your call. If you want me in person, you will pay the 3x rate per day, plus my travel expenses, hotel, airfare, all that. And when I show up, I will be the happiest, dancingest consultant that you have ever seen because I'm excited about the money. But otherwise, I want to stay home and eat from my fridge. Um, Connie says, fortunately, there aren't enough disks for IT at my company, so it's work from home for me. That's kind of awesome. I was just reading this morning about uh, how bad San Francisco real estate has gotten, that uh, there's a 350 California Street is this business, or 350 California Boulevard, something like that. This is giant office building. It's like 75% empty, and it's about to go up uh, for sale again, and it, it's like 80% off because nobody's renting uh, real estate in uh, San Francisco. Uh, Magnus says, enjoy your intro music. Thank you. Says, what genre is that? I don't remember the the, uh, the exact genre. The app that I use is called Pretzel. It's for streamers because you can pay. It's like I'm an, on an old plan, so it's like 5 bucks a month for me, but I think it's like 20 bucks a month if you sign up now, uh, that you can stream online without having to pay royalties. Uh, otherwise, if you listen to the stuff that I listen to, I would have, it's, I'd have to license that stuff. It's kind of crazy. Um, at the moment, uh, the, my current fetish for music is Circle, C-E-R-C-L-E. It's a YouTube channel. It's a bunch of DJs, and they throw uh, beautiful concerts all over the world with different guest artists that are all DJs. Um, so that's Circle. I can't say enough good stuff. Gorgeous. They have concerts in uh, Iceland, at the top of the Eiffel Tower, just all over, uh, at the top of ski slopes. Just beautiful uh, concerts there. 
Next up, Janice says, what blog engines have you used for the last like 15 years? I've been using WordPress, so it just kind of nails it down. I haven't used anything else in the last 15 years. Uh, Mr. M asks a question that comes up all the time. Will Azure SQL put DBAs out of jobs? I'm going to answer that, but while I answer it, it's time to take another ad break for Twitch. So those of you who aren't subscribed will see an ad. Um, you can also subscribe if you're an Amazon Prime member. It's totally free. Log in with Amazon Prime, and uh, you get one subscription that you can use absolutely free. So let's answer that one while uh, folks see an ad break there. Uh, so will Azure SQL put DBAs out of jobs? There are two kinds of database administrators. Development DBAs that help make code go faster, make apps go faster. Production DBAs that take backups, run check DB, monitor for failed agent jobs, and so forth. Production DBAs have dramatically less work to do in Azure SQL DB. Not none. Because it turns out that troubleshooting is a giant pain in the rear up in Azure SQL DB. There are so many more networking problems than you ever had before, security problems. Provisioning uh, happens very differently up in the cloud. The problems are just different. So for right now, I don't see a lot of people getting laid off as production uh, DBAs because the work is so different. But I think over time, over the next five to ten years, production DBAs will be less in demand because the companies that did move up to Azure SQL uh, will no longer need them as much. Development DBAs, it's the exact opposite. Once you start paying for the queries that you run, all of a sudden performance and bills become a huge problem in Azure, and you'd better believe that like crazy, uh, development DBAs are highly in demand. I love it as a consultant because I get paid when I make people's applications go faster, so that's uh, phenomenal. Next up, the Pink Poodle asks, what whiteboarding pool do, tool do you like to use with remote clients? I don't. I don't do remote uh, whiteboarding at all, so I couldn't tell you there. When I'm in person, I like to use an actual whiteboard, but I don't do one for remotely. There was a time when I wanted to. I wanted to have an iPad and do green screening work with it. I wanted to be able to draw right over the screen that you're seeing so that I could over, you know, like point at things. Uh, and I do some of that kind of tricky stuff in my uh, classes. But I never got down to using the whiteboarding stuff successfully. So there's that. Uh, next up, G Surgeon asks, can you tell us what the most important differences are between running a database in 2022 versus 2019 compat level? We want to upgrade, but we're not comfortable yet. Go to brentozar.com and do a search for a compatibility level. In April of 2023, I, po I posted a blog post about how to move to SQL Server 2022. In there, I have a link that goes to the Microsoft documentation page. It's actually really good. This says for every compat level, here are the major changes that it puts in. I was actually surprised by how good that I mean, Microsoft's documentation team is on fire. I, I have to give a shout out. It's not because I know people who work over there. It's actually, even before the people that I know over there went to work over there, last like decade, Microsoft's documentation has been pretty good. Now, granted, there are some features where the documentation's terrible, like how to troubleshoot a, a distributed availability group. But most of the time, if you want the kinds of stuff that's relatively mainstream, like which compat level should I use, it's actually gotten really good. The, the reason why I send you to my blog post first instead of having you just go Google is that Microsoft has like, doc, Books Online has a bunch of pages uh, that talk about compat levels. The one I put in my SQL Server 2022 migration post is the good one, is really good. GOTQN says, is there any risk of using master database objects like SPT values in production routines? Yes. There have been cumulative updates where they didn't honor isolation levels correctly, where things like no lock didn't work correctly on some system objects. Now, that didn't cause a problem if you were keeping your hands off of system objects. But if you are keeping your hands on system objects, you're probably not used to uh, tr uh, testing with each CU to see whether or not those uh, uh, DMVs honor isolation level requests successfully. So keep your hands off those. Use a numbers table instead. 
Uh, next up, Sean asks, after my friend broke up a query uh, into two queries, so it was more sargeable, they're seeing a distinct sort operator before the last concat and select. There's no order by and no distinct in the query. Any insight? Questions like this are so tough to see without seeing the queries. Because let's role play, and Sean, I know you would never do this. I got this query over here, and I swear there's no order by. Oh, what do you know? There's a group by. You mean group by does sorting? Oh, my goodness, I had no idea. Another thing that you can run into is problems with joins, for example. So once I see the query in the query plan, then it's easier to narrow down. Now, I am not inviting you to send me your queries so that I can troubleshoot them for free. I have a finger for questions like that, and it's not your number one in my heart. Uh, instead, if you want to do that, post the query plan at pastheplan.com, and then go ask the question over at dba.stackexchange.com, where there are people with all kinds of uh, free time on their hands and evidently nothing else to do. FedEx just told me my wine is out for delivery. Uh, nothing else to do, so those are my kinds of people. Uh, G Surgeon, oh good. G Surgeon heard the answer. That's very good. The Southern Query Hotshot. So I ha what I, I downloaded. Um, there's a, a voice modifier app, and people use it all the time on Discord. And I've already forgotten what it is. Uh, but I've started the work on setting it up with my little Stream Deck here, so that I can push a button and have my voice change. I am so excited about that. It comes with a bunch of voices like robots and things like that. Uh, so I'm so looking forward to having more voices. Because when I do like the DBA or the uh, um, engine voice or Clippy's voice, it burns my throat out really bad. Part of that is because I don't take good control of or take, take good care of my voice. I tend to drink things like coffee or because I'm streaming in the morning coffee, but otherwise I drink tequila or wine, which is no good for your voice either. Mm. I'm sure that I'm sure that the the voice mod thing doesn't have Clippy. I mean, it's effectively like a Mickey Mouse voice or a Gumby voice, uh, but I totally want to do more of it too. That that is why I keep these hands uh, on my uh, table in here, is as a reminder to myself that I have these, and at some point I could start doing this character again. I even have, as long as we're sharing things, I even have over in my closet, probably where it belongs. Um, something that only really long-term viewers will uh, recognize, a green screen hoodie, uh, so that I could have do my little clippy uh, routine. I have that kept around here in the closet as well. It's kind of horrifying, but at some point I'm going to start busting that out again and do uh, more webcasts with that, because I had a truly delightful time and try and do other characters in as well. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do, oh, Eduardo asks, do you have any recommended tools for comparing two SQL Server instances to show where they're not configured identically? Redgate Schema Compare. Redgate Schema Compare will look at system tables, so like sys configurations. Uh, the, there's a table that shows running trace flags. So that's an easy way to get started with it. There are also things that you can't see as well in T-SQL, things that are out in like the registry. Those are less important to me because they don't change very often. But I would start with Redgate Schema Compare. I say that like I use it all the time. I do not. Generally speaking, clients won't allow me to install uh, third party like page utilities, but I just tell them if you want to do it, that's the tool that I would use if I was you. If I were you, who knows? Dean says if someone wanted to become the Brentos R for Postgres, what advice would you give them? Write the table of contents for your one day training class. Write the table of contents for a one-day training class that you're going to give a year from now. Now, when you write a one-day class, it's going to be about five sessions, five one-hour sessions, because you're going to have time for breaks, time for lunch. Think of it as five one-hour sessions. For every one of those five sessions, that's a major bullet in your table of contents. Write the takeaway slide for each of those modules. So in summary, in this last hour, I taught you that blank. For each of those takeaway slides, now 
write one blog post per bullet point. You have five takeaway slides. Let's say that each one of those has five bullet points on it. That's 25 talking points that you need to nail down. That's 25 blog posts that you're going to write, and it's going to, you're going to schedule them throughout the course of the next six months. You're going to schedule one a week to go live over the next six months. Now, you might think, well, Brent, that means I'm giving away everything for free. I'm basically writing the entire content and putting it out there in the world for the world to see. Yes, that's what you have to do. Because people will only pay you if they trust you. And to trust you, you have to show up repeatedly in their Google search results because that's when they go, oh, I've seen that person. They help me all the time out on the web. They do all this stuff for me. I'd like to see them in training. And you know what the mess part, messed up part is? They will pay for a training course that covers exactly the same stuff that you blogged about. Now, you can't do that too often. You're only probably going to do it once or twice in your career. But the first one that you're building, that's the way that you're going to do it. And then as people are paying you for consulting and for training based on that series of blog posts in this training class that you wrote, then you're going to use that time and money to start building the next training courses, the scripts that you're going to give away for free. And then that's how you gain a reputation and get your foot in the industry. All right. Well, that's a good solid office hours. That's the end for today. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with me. I couldn't do it without you. Y'all are amazing, and you keep coming up with uh, really good questions. So I don't have anything uh, on the schedule today. Uh, I purposely left off today as a, a goof-off day where I can just go do R&D on whatever I want. Uh, so we're having a, a little tricky issue in SQL Constant Care that I'm going to go take a look at it. Ha <laughs> ha, Surly says, wait, you forgot to tell him to buy a Porsche. That's a Porsche. That's a very good point. And to drink tequila. Uh, I've, I've gradually switched over to gin. I still have a lot of good tequila. I just don't drink it as often. Uh, most of the time these days I do gin and tonics uh, just because it's a really easy drink to prepare and really tasty. So thanks for hanging out with me, and I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios.